Good morning. I'm David Haynes, the Opinions Editor at the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Welcome to the special edition of Fourth and State, a video service of the editorial board. Today we're joined by Brad Schimmel, a Republican who is running to be the next Attorney General of Wisconsin. This is one in a series of candidate interviews that we're conducting this fall, all of them streamed live this week at JS Online. We met earlier this week with Susan Happ, a Democrat, who is running for Attorney General, and that interview is available at our YouTube channel and at JS Online. Now each year during the election season, the editorial board invites candidates to sit down with us and discuss the issues. That's what we're going to do this morning. Then we plan to write a series of editorials based on these interviews and on other research that we conduct. We will not make endorsements in these races. We're also joined today by members of the Journal Sentinel's news staff. The editorial board operates independently from the news staff, but we do sit in on one another's meetings. So now let's meet Brad Schimmel. Mr. Schimmel was first elected Waukesha County District Attorney in 2006. He was re-elected in 2008 and 2012. He's been a prosecutor in the county for 23 years and for 16 of those years an assistant DA. Brad Schimmel, welcome to Fourth and State. Thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for being here. Uh, you and your opponent have debated whether the Attorney General has an obligation to defend all of Wisconsin's laws, and you've basically indicated you do. She would make some exceptions. But doesn't the Attorney General have broad discretion in the, such matters, and is a blanket policy like the one you've described the right one? Well, I think it is the right one. When an individual, a business, a family, an educational facility, a, a media uh, company like yours, hires a lawyer, you don't expect that lawyer to make on arguments contrary to your position. You expect that lawyer to represent your interests. When Wisconsin elects an attorney general, they're electing someone to represent their interests. Now, of course, there are going to be times that um, there might be conflicts, but you start with the default position that, yes, you will enforce the laws. Now, if a law has been plainly ruled unconstitutional by a court with authority over the state and a definitive authority, then, then you're done. Then there's no more argument to make. However, you know, a law enjoys a presumption of constitutionality. That's, that's part of our legal system, that it's presumed constitutional until proven otherwise. Therefore, as the Attorney General, you defend it until it has proven otherwise. There can be times when a regulatory agency goes beyond the statutory law. Well, the rules set by regulatory agencies are not subject to that same presumption. And there may be times that you have to, as AG, advise a regulatory agency, you're not following the rules. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're talking about a statute enacted by a legislature or a provision of our Constitution, your job is not to substitute your judgment for the judgment of the people through their elected representatives. But if you found the law, say, morally reprehensible, say it banned uh, interracial marriages, for example, would you take, would you take yourself out of that? And then this is a question, defense? by the way, you've gotten before. Yes, <laughs> yes. So, so it is. Would to you be take fair. yourself out of that, or would you defend the law? Well, now that's an absurd hypothetical because okay. the U.S. Supreme Court resolved that issue 60 years ago, before I was born, and Wisconsin actually probably was never a state that had such a law. Right. So the hypothetical is absurd. Frankly, when I was asked that question previously, I should have declined to answer it because it's senseless. Now, well, what if the law was something you were opposed to morally? You know, it's not my job to substitute my moral views for what the law is in Wisconsin. And, you know, it's also, not, it's also part of the job as Attorney General to, as a state's attorney, you, you represent justice. So you present the facts to the court in, a, in an objective, thorough manner. So the court knows the lay of the land. You present your arguments to the court in an ethical, responsible, and thorough manner and let the court do their job. There are three branches of government, and the Attorney General is part of the executive branch, not the judicial branch. So it's not the Attorney General's job to interpret the Constitution. And yes, it, you know, it could be, there could be the case that someday I would have to defend a law that I would find distasteful. Mm -hmm. It's possible. Okay. Patrick Morrill. Yeah, you said in Sunday's de debate you were not sure if you would defend the campaign coordination statutes. As I understand what you told the Wisconsin State Journal editorial board yesterday, you said that you would. So I wanted to see what your thoughts are on that. And then as part of that, um, 
What would you do in the CRG case? The uh, Government Accountability Board and John Chisholm have been sued. The current Attorney General has declined to represent them. Would you represent them? And if you did, would you represent their interpretations of those coordination statutes? Well, again, the, the, you start from the position that, as Attorney General, you defend the laws of our state. And you defend the state agencies when, and, and representatives of those agencies when they are sued. Now, working a little bit backward, the Government Accountability Board is being sued, and the AG has had to uh, has had to decline to represent them and have a special uh, attorney or special counsel appointed because of the fact that the AG has already advised um, uh, Judge Peterson regarding his actions in the case. So he's got there's a conflict for our current AG and his office to handle it. So special counsel's been assigned. The GAB will be represented by an, an attorney working for the state. That is the that's the responsibility of the state of Wisconsin to have that lawyer represent the uh, the rep the uh, the bodies that serve our state. In addition to that conflict, the, the attorney general did cite that conflict because of his other client, but he also right. said that he thought their views of campaign finance laws, campaign coordination laws, were tenuous. Um, right. Do you not share that view with Attorney General Van Hollen, and you think that their views on these coordination laws could be uh, argued before a court uh, as they see them? Well, I understand. I understand your question. You know, I'm, I'm not privy to the to the client attorney conversations that have taken place between the Attorney General and representatives of the Government Accountability Board. So I'm not sure what, what positions have been discussed relative to all of that. Again, your starting position is you do represent them, but if a regulatory agency goes beyond the authority that the legislature gives to them, then you might have to advise that, like, that rep, a regulatory agency that you're in conflict with the law. Well, their views have been pretty public, which is that you can regulate collaboration between a candidate and an outside group, even if there, it's not express advocacy, that there would be some kinds of issue advocacy uh, that you could regulate if there's coordination. Do you agree with that view? I agree that, there, that that's one argument that could be made, and therefore the case is going to have to proceed through the courts until we get finality on it. Can I jump in a little bit here since we're talking about voting and elections? Um, the Supreme Court blocked the voter ID yes. law. The Attorney General said he was going to try to get it enacted. Isn't he, isn't that fantasy? Aren't, isn't the, the, the public going to go to the polls under the existing law, not this new law that the legislature enacted? I, I don't see how this is going to be possible. With, you know, the reason that the Supreme Court intervened and said the law can't go into effect for November 4th is because the time was so short. Well, the time's gotten even shorter. We're less than three weeks away from the election. I don't know how, I don't know how this could be repaired, and and then still get back in front of the U.S. Supreme Court to have them now lift their injunction because they're the only court that has the authority to do that. I don't think this is. I don't think there's any practical way to accomplish that. As a DEA, have you encountered many, very many cases of, of voter fraud in Waukesha County? You know, it turns out we're not ground zero for voter fraud in Waukesha County. Um, but you we know, have had, we have had cases, and I've had some that I have where we've we've identified a suspect, and we've had to refer them to other counties, because under Wisconsin law now, election violations are prosecuted in the county where the person resides. Right. So we've had to refer those to other counties, and have been disappointed at times in the results because we thought we had a solid investigation, and they didn't go anywhere. But uh, yes, we've had voter fraud cases. Um, you know, we most of the trouble I've seen happened in 2012 when we had eight months with elections that year okay. and we did have a number of people who did vote twice and ultimately in most of ultimately in most of those I concluded that we simply I simply couldn't prove the person did it intentionally it might have been an elderly person that was frequently the case very elderly people who voted absentee thought they were going to be out of town then they were in town and just didn't realize oh this was the June election I thought this was the May one it we weren't able to ch prosecute those. There have been other cases, though, where we've had reported to us that someone's vote was used, but um, we haven't been able to. We don't know who did it. Without any kind of an ID, you have no way of proving the case. Oftentimes, people who are critical of voter ID laws will say, "You don't. none of those cases have been prosecuted. Of course not, because if no one ID'd the person who came and voted, I'll never have a suspect to prosecute. 
you have to listen carefully to the arguments. So is there, you said Waukesha is not ground zero for voter ID, yeah. for voter fraud. Is there a ground zero for voter fraud? I don't know the answer to that, but I, I just know what happens in my county. And a large part of why, um, well, the best way to prevent someone from stealing your vote is to use it. And, um, and Waukesha County, we typically have very large voter turnout in the big elections, and I think that helps. I want to follow up on something that you said to Patrick. You said it's not the job of the Attorney General to interpret the Constitution, yet the Attorney General is frequently advising uh, cities and counties and other agencies on uh, what is and is not constitutional, and you're also offering opinions, legal opinions, about what is, what is correct or not correct according to the law. Are there not instances in which you are interpreting the Constitution or helping people to determine whether what's going on is, is appropriate or not? Well, I think most of the time when the Attorney General issues formal opinions, those deal with interpretation of state statutes. Okay. Um, they don't generally advise municipalities as to whether their actions are constitutional. I don't, I don't think that's typically the case. Um, I guess that may happen, but I'm not aware. I haven't seen those opinions being issued by the AG. What's your view of the state's John Doe process, and do you think that needs to be reformed in any way? Yeah, there there is a crisis in confidence. I, it it seems evident that many people, and my, and on Sunday my opponent agreed that uh, too many people are not confident in the nature of the process. It works well when you're investigating a drug conspiracy or a murder or a missing person. Those things it can be an effective tool. The problem is when it's used to investigate political problems, it, it gets political, and then people lose confidence. You know, it's supposed to be a secret investigation, and unfortunately, you know, with the, the John Doe that's caught all the attention in Milwaukee, is it hasn't been secret. So um, that has caused leaks, and that has contributed to the lack of confidence, and it's it contributed to the view that some have that it's a witch hunt. Do, do you think it is? You know, I don't know any more than the person, anybody else reading the newspaper and learning more. I am, I am concerned that you've had judges who have looked at, who have looked at some of the work product and said you don't have probable cause of a crime, and yet it continues on. I'm concerned about that. Is there a way to change that law to, to address those concerns? There may be, and it may be a matter of when you've got, and we've we've got many circumstances where we have special laws designed to deal with election type cases or campaign finance cases such as the law that was created some years ago to to say that, a, that an elected official or a person who commits an election fraud or campaign violation has to be prosecuted in the county where they reside. So we could certainly also create a, a law that addresses John Doe proceedings or investigations when you're doing a political type investigation and put put some additional checks and balances in so you don't have uh, you don't have a local DA with so much unfettered power. So, so let's be s specific here. Um, do you believe that John Chisholm, as DA, has misused the John Doe process in uh, pursuing these uh, John Doe 1 and John Doe 2? I just, I don't know any more than uh, but other individuals DA, who read. You're a DA. You've actually had John Doe cases, I, I assume, right? I have, yes. I, that's more than most people have had. So you, you have more insight into this than most people. So do you think that he's misused the process? I just don't know how to answer that because I don't know enough information. I'm among those people who, who is experiencing a crisis in confidence on this. You know John Chisholm, though, and I, I'm, I'm wondering, based on your experience with him, do you have any uh, reason to believe that he would politicize a John Doe investigation? You know, I do know him, and we've known, we knew each other as assistant DAs, um, and right. we both ran for DA at the same time in our respective counties. And as an assistant DA, I knew him to be um, a hard-nosed prosecutor running the, uh, the, the uh, gun unit in Milwaukee County. And um, I was recognized in my county as a hard-nosed prosecutor, too, and we both were law enforcement's choice when we ran for, for DA in our respective counties. We have had, we have had a positive, professional relationship as neighboring county DAs over the years. We have not engaged in any discussions at all about, um, about what's happening with the John Doe proceedings. I don't know what's motivating him. I don't have any information about that. I just don't know. 
Um, on John Doe proceedings in general, do you think that the gag rules uh, infringe the target's free speech rights under the First Amendment? I'm concerned about that, yeah. Um, and especially, you know, it's one thing the John Doe statute and, and the case law can authorizes a court to order someone to not talk about their testimony. But to expand that beyond and say you can't talk about the fact that there's an investigation, you can't talk about the fact that your home was, was raided, uh, I, I don't know how that can be justified under our current law so and, if that was and with the Constitution. So if that was challenged in court, would you defend it? Well, the actions of the court. Well, if, if someone made a facial challenge to the John Doe statute, the, the, gag, the broad gag order, um, or, or a specific gag order that was as broad as, as this, w uh, would you be willing to, to defend that? You're talking about defending the language of our current John Doe statute? Yes. But, okay. What, what about the kind of broad orders that sometimes happen in John Doe cases where there is an absolute ban on speaking about the matter except well, to your attorney? Well, that's not going to be the job of the attorney general to defend the actions of the court in, in putting such a broad gag order on someone. Sure that's, it is. That's I going mean, to happen. The AG is representing Judge Peterson right now. Uh, uh, the Attorney General represented Judge Sumi in the Act 10 case. Uh, the Attorney General often represents judges when their orders are challenged in writs. How would you do that if you had a judge who gave that kind of order? Well, we would have, and you're right, in, in the appellate court if someone challenged the order, the AG's office does handle felony appeals. So we would be representing, we would represent the state on that. And, and you'd be okay with that even though you're concerned that it could be overbroad and infringement on the First Amendment? If you know, right now, I, I go, as DA, I go to court on cases where someone's challenging a search conducted by police, and um, I, ha I may come into it having concerns about whether this search really was valid under the Fourth Amendment. I'll go to court. I will present to the judge the truth about what happened. We'll present the evidence in a clear and complete way, and I'll make legal arguments that are consistent with the law and the precedent, and we'll let the court make the decision. I wanted to ask you, um, before I get to the OLR case against HAP, it, it, the thought just occurred to me. One out of five voters in this state have no idea who either of you are. The state is bitterly polarized. Yeah. So if I'm going into the booth, you're a Republican who's to the right. She's a Democrat, center left. I mean, what it really is the difference? You're both competent attorneys. And there's really no difference between you other than one's an R and one's a D. I, I disagree with that wholeheartedly, and actually my opponent disagrees with you too. She said so on Sunday. She agreed that there are big differences, and Wisconsin has a clear choice between, between me and her. And the big differences are experience. And I don't just measure experience by time in the chair, but by leadership. And our, our experience in that measure doesn't compare at all. You know, it's 25 years versus six years. But it's 25 years, even as an assistant DA, I had a footprint bigger than just, the, just Waukesha County. She doesn't have any of those accomplishments that she can list. And then on the other side of this, we offer a very different, profoundly different philosophy for the role of the Attorney General because she wants to be a super legislator. Frankly, she's running for a different job. She wants to be a judge who decides what's constitutional or she wants to be a legislator that decides what policy should be. The attorney general is the executive branch. The executive branch, this is, this is high school civics. The executive branch enforces the law. But doesn't J.B. Van Hollen run his office like you're, you're describing HAP? I, you know what, I, I'm not running against J.B. Van Hollen. Decisions he's made may be different than how, how I'll do them as attorney general. On the, the OLR has dismissed the case against HAP because it found she was walled off from the case. Does that settle the issue? Do you think she acted improperly? Well, there are a number of things that are left unresolved. Now, first off, the OLR addressed only one thing, and that was whether her office keeping the case violated the state ethical rules for attorneys. That's it. And it concluded that it didn't. You're still left with the complaints that the victim has, that the deal that was cut was unconscionable in her view, that her pleas to have a special prosecutor handle the case were simply ignored, that she was told that she couldn't talk to the media. And Ms. Happ has, had, has said, well, I can't talk about those things because there's a victim. So we don't have the answers to all those questions yet. 
But there's one part of it that she could answer, and that is talk about the deal. When, how much money was owed when the, when the decision was made in the uh, sexual assault case? How much was there a balloon payment? When did this start? What were the monthly payments? We don't know any of that information. Blunt, or do you think she's lying about the case? I'm, I'm not going to accuse her of lying, but I'll, I know this. On Sunday, she misstated the facts when she stated that the, uh, that the criminal referral came to her office after the land contract was done. That was false. And I don't know if she intentionally misstated or just under the pressure of being in that setting made a mistake. I don't know. Have you seen the Republican Party ads on this? I assume you have, right? I haven't seen ads on it. Well, the, I've heard radio ads. Yeah, the radio ads. I'm sorry, the radio ads. Um, do you agree with what the Republican Party saying about her handling of this case? They're raising questions about uh, the concerns that the victim raised. And, and you agree with those, right? I do. And, you know, I agree with the with the um, uh, with the editorial that that your newspaper issued some time ago. She should have gotten off the case, because even when there's not a technical violation of the ethical rules, you have to go beyond that and avoid something that appears to have impropriety. And here you have a victim saying, "I was calling out for you to get off this case, and I was ignored." When, when w this came out, they compared this case to the Kramer case and said that y you and she handled those cases similarly. Do you see parallels between those or not? I don't. With the, with the Kramer case, there and, was and first up. just to explain up. Bill Kramer, we're yeah. talking about Bill Kramer, who was a campaign contributor to you, and right. he was the assembly majority leader. He was charged with two uh, felony counts of sexual assault. Go, go ahead. Right. So in the Kramer case, when we got when we heard the news about the allegations from Washington, D.C., we made a decision to take the contribution he made to my campaign, and it wasn't thousands of dollars. It wasn't $180,000. This was, this was a $500 contribution to my campaign. We made a decision to donate that to the local women's shelter, to charity, because based on those allegations from Washington, D.C., that was money we didn't want to have. We felt at that point that money was tainted. So we got rid of it. That money, we made that decision before any victim ever came to the Waukesha County DA's office to say a crime happened in Waukesha County. So I had no ongoing relationship at all, much less financial, with, with Representative Kramer after, uh, after we returned that money at the time that the charge was made. So I don't have the same kind of conflict or appearance of conflict in this case that, that Ms. Happ does in hers. And um, we are working closely with the victim. There, the other big difference here, there's no complaint being, being waged by the victim against, against my office based on how she's being treated. Can we get back just one thing on, on the OLR? Have you ever had a complaint against you? If so, how was it resolved? I have had um, individuals file complaints against me, yes, and um, they've been resolved by OLR notifying me that there's a letter, that there's been a complaint, they ask me for a response, and then I shortly thereafter get a letter saying, um, we've resolved this, that there is no violation. All of the complaints that have been filed against me have come from people that are in prison as a result of me prosecuting and putting them there. You, you mentioned a moment ago that you would not accuse Susan Happ of lying, that, you, that she misstated the facts, but you wouldn't go so far as to accuse her of lying. Your campaign has accused her of lying. Uh, your campaign manager has put out statements. Uh, quoting the campaign manager saying she's lying. Of course, you control your campaign. Would you rescind that, or are you comfortable with your campaign manager and others she, associated with your campaign calling her a liar? She made, she made a statement on Sunday that was false, and either she intentionally misled, which would be a lie, or she made a mistake. I don't know the answer to that for sure. But you're comfortable with him calling her a liar? I am. Okay. So, but, but you don't think she's a liar? You, you personally wouldn't go so I don't, far as calling her I don't know that for sure. And she, she told us on Monday that she made a mistake. So that would mean that if well, she lied the first time, she lied a second time. What's troubling about, about her claim that it's a mistake is you, I think you can make the mistake and get the wrong year. But she also said that that criminal referral came in after the land contract was done. That strikes me as a harder mistake to make. So I, I, I'm concerned about that's why I remain concerned about whether she intended to mislead 
or simply made a mistake. So the Republican Party is also trying to make the case that she has been um, soft on sex offenders, that she's not pursued sex offenders as, as tough as she said, as, as tough as she should, and that she has pleaded out a lot of these. Um, do you agree with that assessment of how she's handled sex crimes? You know, the outside groups are making, as you know well, the outside groups are, are feeding you and others in the media complaints about both of us. They're finding cases that have been amended by our offices or cases where we've recommended probation and they're trying to make, trying to make some hay with this. this. A lot of this is simply distraction, and, but my record is my record is sound. I've prosecuted thousands and thousands of cases and I was recommend I was recognized years ago now as one of as by the Wisconsin Association of Victim and Witness Professionals as professional of the year based on my work defend, protecting victims of sexual assault and child abuse. So my record's clear on this. Um, they, they are there are cases that have been found in Jefferson County that lead some questions. That's what the outside groups are doing and they're doing it on both sides. Are, are there any decisions in particular, any cases in particular that you have concerns about how she handled? I'm not really pursuing that angle as, as part of my campaign, so I haven't studied those cases. I haven't gotten the criminal complaints um, from the cases she's dealt with. I don't have the, we don't have any of the um, public record request information that anybody might have gained on that. We're not coordinating with the outside groups. Whatever, whatever decisions may be coming from the federal court, um, even this week, we're, we're playing very cautious. We are not coordinating with outside groups. When some ads began yesterday on my behalf, some positive ads that an outside group ran, actually two outside groups started, those took us by surprise. We did not know those ads were starting. We didn't know what they were going to say. It just, yesterday we found out when they started them. Let me change gears, gears here quickly. Um, <clears throat> Wisconsin has one of the highest African American, African -American men uh, incarceration rates in the country. Um, it's been well documented. It was reported by a UWM uh, researcher. Um, does that concern you? And what can you do as the AG to uh, try to curb those numbers? Yes, it absolutely concerns me. And I, I think it's an embarrassing statistic. There are a number of embarrassing statistics for the state of Wisconsin, and we need to do some work to change a lot of things, like teen birth rates, um, uh, school graduation rates in, in the MPS. There are a lot of things that need to change that, as Attorney General, I, I can't change. But there is some place where I think the Attorney General can play an important role in affecting the population of our prisons, and that is through drug treatment courts. And I'm proud that years ago, I led the charge to create Waukesha County's Drug Treatment Court, which has been up and running now for three years. And we're changing lives there. And I also led the charge statewide because I served on the statewide task force that developed the recommendations that became Representative John Nigren's, or most of Representative John Nigren's, HOPE legislation, a series, a package of bills designed to address heroin and prescription opiate uh, abuse in Wisconsin. <coughs> Those bills, by the way, passed our legislature unanimously. I'm proud to have served on the committee that developed those recommendations, and it took a lot of hard work and took a lot of disagreement until we came to a consensus on that. Those recommendations included funding startup grants for drug treatment courts, and thanks to those recommendations and that work we did, the legislature last year put $5 million into funding treatment uh, treatment courts in Wisconsin, treatment and diversion courts, I should say, in Wisconsin. I will continue as Attorney General to, to work to make sure every county in the state has that kind of program available. Because I, I saw estimates when um, Represent, Representative Nigren's uh, press announcement about uh, the bills came out, the estimate he had there was 166,000 people in Wisconsin that are addicted to heroin and prescription opiates. We can't and nor should we lock all those people up. But using the old traditional methods in the criminal justice system hasn't been successful for us. We've learned the hard way that people that are addicted to these particular drugs, if you use the old standard probation, you're dooming them to fail. And when they fail, they're either going to head down one course or they end up with a fatal overdose, which is not acceptable, or they end up in prison 
because of their relapses and because of their inability to follow those rules, that's not acceptable either. Drug you, treatment courts change that. Are you worried about being looked at as being soft on crime by going the drug treatment route? You know, I don't know if, if anyone made the accusation that that's soft on crime, I, they're uninformed. Um, it simply isn't soft on crime. It is, it is the best thing we've got going to turn lives around. And nationwide, it's having a positive impact on our nation. And statewide, the, uh, the many counties that have started these up now are having positive impacts in their counties. It's, it's good for Wisconsin, and we have to do something to reduce that prison population. Can I, can I follow up on uh, your, your comment a, a minute ago about, about outside groups? I, I hear in your comments some frustration there. Uh, and yeah. I know that uh, a whole lot of voters feel frustrated this time yep. of year with all the messages we're getting. Uh, most of them are negative. Right. So are there any that are being run on your side that you would disavow at this point? What would you say to the outside groups that are running ads on your well, side? Well, I'm thrilled that the, that the ads that started up yesterday, a radio buy and a TV buy, both came out with positive ads. Mm -hmm. I didn't know for sure whether that was going to be the case. I'm very happy that that's happened because, you know, I, one of the people who drives me around the state is a, uh, a retired salesman and, um, or semi-retired salesman. I don't think they ever really end it. But, um, you know, he tells me, you, Brad, you don't, you don't sell your product by telling somebody how bad your opponent's product is. You make the sale by telling them how good yours is. Mm. And we're struggling mightily. And I think my opponent is too, to try to get people to pay attention to what we offer. And I'm, I think I offer the winning message in this case. So are you concerned that, that the candidate's message in the race is being drowned out by the outside groups? Well, the outside groups are just getting in. Right. Um, but we've been, you know, I've been in this for just over a year now. We've been, we have been doing media interviews statewide around the state for, for a year now. There's the information out there. There are, we both have websites. People can go to our websites and find out who we are, what our background is, what we stand for, what our vision for the office is. If they go to my website, they're going to find out that I have specific comprehensive plans for many of the state's most difficult public safety challenges. Things that they'll go to my opponent's website and find she doesn't have those. I hope that people are going to take that look. And unfortunately, you know, people complain about negative ads, but the, uh, the political pundits all conclude that they work because in the last few weeks of a race, all the negative ads hit the airwaves and all of a sudden people now start to pay attention. Patrick? And I, I just would like to remind our, um, our panel, too, to speak up a little bit so everyone watching can hear you. You mentioned a little bit ago that uh, you might not do everything the same as our current Attorney General, J.B. Van Hollen. Right. Can you cite an example of two, something that he's done that you would have handled differently? Uh, yes. Um, his, his decision to not defend the domestic partner registry law, um, I, when I did my research on that, I concluded there wasn't any court decision that, uh, that concluded that that was in conflict with our, uh, with our constitutional amendment. And I also, uh, it, it also didn't appear on the face of the two laws, of the law and the constitutional amendment, that they were in conflict. So I, I would have defended that law passed by our legislature. But, but initially, you said, initially, you said that you would, you would right. not, that the Constitution uh, trumped stat statutes right. is the phrase that you use with me, and that it was a clear violation of, of the 2006 amendment. So wh why did you have that view in June, and yeah. now, after every court has ruled unanimously that the law was not in conflict with the Constitution, wh when did you have this change of heart? Are you sure our meeting was a little earlier than June when we had that interview? But uh, It's possible it was May. Okay. It was published in June. Okay. But uh, when we met, I, I made a mistake that day. I knew, what I knew about it was that the, Wisconsin, the current Wisconsin Attorney General concluded that the law conflicted with the, sta with the constitutional amendment. Um, it was kind of, I don't, I don't think the nature of our whole discussion was on that. I think- No, no, we talked about many we, subjects that day. We were talking about mostly about my heroin plan that day, mm -hmm. as I recall. And that kind of came as, as an, at, an afterthought or end of the interview question. I made a mistake. I, uh, 
because the current attorney general had made the con come to the conclusion that it was unconstitutional, I shouldn't have answered the question that day. I should have said, I'll have to get back to you because after that interview, I did do the research and I did, I did conclude myself that it wasn't clearly unconstitutional and I, and I did very shortly after that in another interview with a media outlet say that I made a mistake and I was changing my position but on your, that. Your principle now is different from that because you said it's not the AG's responsibility to decide whether something's constitutional or not. You're just supposed to, to defend the law or the constitutional amendment, right? Yes. So, so you've now made two changes since your discussion with him in June. One, you made a decision that you would defend this because it was constitutional, and now you come to the position that you'll defend any law, whether, uh, whether it's, you believe it's constitutional or not, correct? Well, I, I'll disagree with you. I think I made one mistake, and I've owned up to that. I made the mistake of saying I wouldn't, defend, wouldn't have defended the domestic partner registry law. I, I have conceded my error on that. It was, I couldn't find any authority to say it was unconstitutional. And I, like I said, I made a mistake that day. I remedied it quickly. And, and you know what? When I make a decision as attorney general about whether I'm going to defend a law, I won't make that decision based on a, 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 quest, make, on a snap judgment in an interview with a reporter. We'll make that decision after consulting with a legal team, doing the legal research, and then when making the announcement after a formal decision has been made. This was, you know, it, it came up quickly. And again, I said I made a mistake. How, how do you think JB has done as Attorney General? You know, looking, looking back on my 25 years as a frontline prosecutor, I've never seen the relationship between the DOJ and the frontline law enforcement and prosecutors as positive as it is now. And I know that law enforcement agrees with me on that as well because when JB ran for, for re-election, he had, I think it was, it was over 60 sheriffs that were publicly endorsing him and many Democrats as well because he has dramatically changed that relationship. You know, I can remember times when the DOJ would contact a local DA's office and you kind of were worried. It was almost, almost felt like internal affairs was contacting you. It hasn't been that way for the last eight years. When they've reached out, it's been as an offer of help, as a resource, and if you didn't want their help, they, they left you alone. And they said, well, call us if anything changes. I've enjoyed, that relationship's been great. He has gone after some of the things that, um, that he promised he would, like the crime log back crime lab DNA backlog. That has been, that's been taken care of. We've gone, I remember before in a, I had a case back before he was elected where we had a serious home invasion sexual assault. Waited eight months to get our DNA results. Fast forward to uh, October 1st of 2009, uh, we had a, sec a serious sexual assault in my county, uh, excuse me, a, a serious homicide in my county. We got our DNA results in three weeks. Um, big change, big swing in the circumstances, and I'm pleased with the, he, he kept his commitment on that. Um, I think he has done well to keep the politics out of it. The first four years, he had a legislature and a governor that did not sit on the same political side of the aisle as he does, and yet I don't recall there being, uh, being headlines about blowouts between the governor and the attorney general. They seem to have gotten along and they seem to have done their work the way they're supposed to, serving the people of Wisconsin, and let the elections make the decisions about who's in which office. So I'm pleased with what he's done. I, I give him an A- minus for that. Bill? Um, I wanted to ask you, it's, it's sort of stunning that uh, both of you have cases against po the, 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 that involved political operatives. And in your case, it was, uh, you know, Assembly Speaker Scott Jensen. He got the misdemeanor rather than the felony. I know you answered this before, but why do you believe that was the best resolution of the case? I mean, he's still, even though he's not in elective office, he's, he's still on the fringes of politics. Is that, is that really um, a good thing? Well, how do, you, how do you ever prohibit someone from being on the fringes of politics? We, we, have, we have First Amendment rights to participate in the in the political process, no matter what your circumstances are. Even a, you know, prison inmates can't vote, but they still have freedom of speech. Um, so the original case, which would had, this had all begun 
this was almost a decade old by the time it came to my office from the beginning of that case. In the original trial, the court concluded that it was, it was mishandled and the convictions were thrown out. So when it came to me, the only thing left was the misdemeanor that Mr. Jensen didn't appeal. We secured additional convictions that resulted in a prohibition from him ever holding office or running for office again. He repaid the state of Wisconsin for the enormous legal fees that we had originally fronted to him, and that's what our law provides, and he paid a hefty election fine. His family spent nearly 10 years um, waiting for resolution of this. The caucus scandal that began all of this, well, that was resolved. That was remedied long before the case ever came to my office. We got rid of, as a system, we got rid of that whole caucus system, which was a terrible idea. So all of the problems that were left as a result of this were resolved. And when we, in a new trial, we would have faced a very different set of circumstances because as the appellate court said, Mr. Jensen would be entitled to bring in evidence about what the other side was doing and not doing because it was, the whole issue was about whether you were gaining a dishonest and unfair advantage over your opposition. And you know what, no one, the, the jury would have been left to wonder why no one from the Democrat side in the assembly was ever prosecuted. So this, this process, as you said, went 10 years, but it's not- or nearly because, that, yeah. But it wasn't the prosecutor's fault that it went 10 years. Um, Representative Jensen filed appeal after appeal after appeal, and by settling it with a misdemeanor, did you not reward him for dragging out the process? Well, you know, any defendant who's accused of a crime has a right to appeal their cases. That, and you know, I, I have I have murderers who who have appealed their cases for many many years, and victims are frustrated by that. Um, but that is their right. And why would Mr. Jensen have any less right than any other criminal defendant? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hold against him exercising a right that belongs to him. So are politics in this state, do they appear dirty or are they clean? I think, I think, well, you know, most of my experience is, you know, what I, what I know about politics outside of Waukesha County has been, you know, what I read in the newspapers and, and see on TV. But in Waukesha County, I think our politics are very clean. You, I'm sorry, Patrick, go ahead. Okay. Um, you opposed universal background checks on guns. Yes. Um, would you, you, you say that bad guys don't fill out the forms, and that's true, but would you uh, favor any lessening of the restrictions now, of the current restrictions on gun owners to, to purchase guns? Would you, would you have fewer background checks? You know, those are legislative decisions to make. Um, right now, the law is working. You know, our concealed carry law is working. We haven't had the gunfight the at the OK Corral that some people were worried we were going to have. Um, things are going well. I don't see any reasons for us to, to mess around with that law. And you know, in terms of keeping people safe from gun violence, we really need to focus on going after the individuals who shouldn't have guns already or are using them to commit violent crimes. And I just this morning released a uh, issued a press release talking about one of my plans to try to address this and I've offered that as Department of Justice we will offer to the Milwaukee County DA's office help with investigating and prosecuting gun cases because they're well we know from press re press uh, information or media information that was released earlier this year that um, less than half of the drug, drug uh, excuse me gun cases that were referred to the Milwaukee DA's office during a three month period last summer got prosecuted I don't know all the reasons for that, and I'm not here attacking the Milwaukee DA's office. What I am doing is offering help, because clearly we have too much violence going on in, in some parts of the city of Milwaukee, and those communities need help. They deserve to have safe communities. Parents in any part, any community, deserve to know that their child is safe standing at the bus stop or on the playground or on their front porch, and we need to take the criminals, the dangerous criminals who are using guns for violence out of the community. But, but you say um, bad guys don't fill out background, you know, don't go through the process. Right. S some of them do, right? Or, or are you assuming that no bad guy <coughs> will ever buy a gun the legal way or try to? You know, you, there's straw purchases all the time and, and things like that. Shouldn't there be harsher penalties for people doing stuff like that? 
Oh, I'd favor that. Absolutely. If you're yeah. if you're attempting to do a straw purchase, absolutely, I would favor going after that person vigorously. I, I think the gun laws we have, though, are adequate. We just have to enforce them, and we have to we have to make the case to judges that a person who would do that, who would illegally try to obtain a gun, is a person we can't count on to use that gun safely, and they need to be they need to be punished. What would you tell um, someone like Police Chief Flynn who says that we need more gun laws to keep our streets safe because we're losing the gun battle? What, what would you tell him? That Would you tell him that there are enough laws in place to, to do that? Yes. The gun laws we have are adequate to prosecute the people who commit crimes with guns. When you create more laws to, that make it more difficult to get a gun, you make it more difficult for law-abiding gun owners to exercise their rights, but criminal, a criminal who's going to rob a liquor store or have a shootout in the streets does not care whether they obtain that gun the legal way, and they don't care whether they have a concealed carry permit when they stuff it into the back of their waistband and go down the street with it. This, this is the problem, is we're, we're not focusing on the right people. Don't focus on making it more difficult for law-abiding gun owners. And I think no, no matter what neighborhood you live in, you should have the right to, you should be able to exercise your Second Amendment right. That is a privilege that our founding fathers put in place, and we should well, be very about, wary of, of interfering with that. Well, what he talks about is not, is not uh, barring legal owners from, you know, from getting guns, but people with misdemeanors, for example, multiple misdemeanors who can still get guns and still walk around with guns. Um, should, that, should that be changed? You know, when I heard, when I heard Chief Flynn's criticisms of that, yeah. um, I also heard concerns in there that we that people were not being prosecuted fully on their earlier cases, that they were getting misdemeanor resolutions when they should have gotten a felony conviction. Right. So, you know, I think again, you can look at the laws we have, and and if we <coughs> utilize them effectively, we can take care of that without more laws. It's up to the legislature whether we wanted to create a law that said if you had five misdemeanors, you could, you could have a gun prohibition. I, I guess that's up to them. Um, it, it'd be pretty hard to argue that after five misdemeanors, um, you shouldn't have some consequence to, to your civil rights. But, um, but that's a legislative determination. I, I am not uh, on board with, uh, I'm not arguing that we need more gun laws. I'm arguing we need to f enforce them more effectively. Can I ask another question on this? When, when you say is you don't want to make it harder for legal gun owners to purchase guns, is it really hard to purchase a gun if you're a legal gun? If you could carry a gun, it's not that hard to purchase a gun. So how would more laws make it difficult for uh, a person to, to purchase a gun? I don't understand that. Well, if, you're, if you had universal background checks, that would mean that if I sold a gun to you, I would be responsible for somehow determining that I could legally sell that gun to you. How am I going to do that? Or vice versa, I might have to, you might have to prove to me that you can. How, how do we do that as private citizens? We, when new guns come into the system, that's coming through gun dealers. Mm -hmm. But individuals who have already purchased those guns legally through gun dealers can, can make decisions to sell those to other individuals. How do those individuals do that process? How will that work? I, I just don't know how that wouldn't be, wouldn't make things more difficult for private gun owners. Um, as someone who's been endorsed by the NRA, uh, would you support constitutional carry, which would allow law-abiding citizens to carry a weapon without um, getting a state permit? You know, again, that's a that's a legislative determination. Our concealed carry law is working. People who are are seeking uh, permits to be able to carry concealed and and can and pass the background check for it are getting those permits quickly and, no, and bad things aren't happening as a result of those law-abiding <coughs> gun owners getting, arming themselves. So I, I'm, not, I'm not beating the drum for making changes to our concealed carry law in Wisconsin. If that were changed to constitutional carry, do you think Wisconsin would be safer, more dangerous, or about the same? I don't think that, I think about the same. I, I also wanted to ask about the case of Chris Weissmuller. He, he was an attorney from Waukesha, referred to you by Milwaukee County prosecutors mm -hmm. and found evidence on, uh, that, that he had deleted evidence um, from a client's computer that would be of interest to investigators. Uh, you decided not to charge him uh, if he agreed to report it to OLR, right. which he did. 
why did you believe that offense was not worth charging? And do you think the result, which was a, a public reprimand, was a sufficient uh, punishment for him? Well, the Office of Lawyer Regulation is the agency that deals with lawyer misconduct. So it is appropriate for the Office of Lawyer Regulation to address what happened. It was clear from the case that, that Mr. Weissmuller did not intend to prevent authorities from getting the information because during the interview with law enforcement, when they asked a question about information they were looking for on a computer, Mr. Weissmuller readily offered up, oh, we have that. I simply put that on my work computer at my office. I can get that for you. And he did, and it turned out the, the information was there. He didn't volunteer that until after investigators came to his client and said, we found on your computer evidence that um, files had been deleted and that uh, software had been downloaded to wipe it clean. Um, do you think that he had any kind of responsibility to alert prosecutors that he had material that he knew would be of uh, value to their investigation prior he, to them discovering that, that those things had been I, done on the I listened computer? To the, I listened to the recordings of the interview. He offered the information as soon as he was asked. Do, do you know Chris at all? I do. He's been a practice. He was a practicing attorney in Waukesha. I don't know if he still is. And he was active in Republican politics there too, as well. Not that I'm aware of. Not. And he did run for. Um, he did run for city attorney last year or earlier this year. Um, before that, I did not know anything about his political involvement. I'm. I'm not sure he has or ever has been. He gave you a hundred dollars a month after his OLR case was resolved. Did that give you any pause accepting that money? You know, I didn't even make note of it. It had been, um, the OLR case was resolved. We had, we had made the determination in the case quite a while before that. Um, I, I didn't even make a note of, of it at the time. I, I've been recently alerted that, that that happened. It didn't even occur to me. And, and now that you have become aware of it, you, you're comfortable with it? You see any need to give that money back? Well, there certainly wasn't any quid pro quo. Uh, Mr. Weissmuller made a decision that, uh, that I was the right candidate to be Attorney General, and he supported that financially. Um, we had noticed, well, at the time that we worked out the resolution of his case, I had no aspirations to run for Attorney General. Let me ask you a question about open government. The Attorney General has some influence over how the state's yes. open meetings and open records laws are enforced. Um, what sort of specific steps would you take as Attorney General to ensure that the public uh, that those laws which um, serve the public mm -hmm. are fully enforced? Well, I have a couple things that I would like to do as Attorney General addressing public records and open meetings, and one of them is to bring our public records and open meetings laws into this century. They were written before the Internet existed, so there w there's no guidance on what to do when you're talking about email communications among government officials. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in there to address whether a uh, whether a public official can appear at a school board meeting via Skype. Um, there's nothing in there to address metadata, that information contained behind, uh, electronic information be came, be contained behind the actual raw data that's collected by an agency. All of those things were left with no guidance. Texting during meetings? Yes, absolutely. For example. Um, and, uh, you know, in Waukesha County, we had a case where we had a high speed chase that went through three different jurisdictions. All three jurisdictions had squad cameras. And one of that, when the media came and asked for the squad cam videos, one of the, one of the outlets said, or excuse me, one of the agencies did no balancing test and said, no, you can't have anything because it's a pending investigation. Another agency did no balancing test and said, here, you can have everything. The third agency, it's kind of like the three bears here. <laughs> the third agency did a balancing test and said, you can have these items, these items we can't release at this time, and they gave their reasons why they couldn't be released. That's the proper way. The problem we have is there's very little guidance out there. There's not consistent guidance. There's plenty of guidance. The problem is it's not consistent from agency to agency. We've seen it too in the uh, Federal Driver Protection, uh, a Driver Privacy Protection Act case that came out of Palatine, Illinois, where we now have a wide array of decisions by local law enforcement agencies that are resulting at times in, in agencies blacking out all, na all identifying information from an accident report. So we have, we have uh, 
individual will have attorneys contact our office and say, I'm representing this person in a civ potential civil lawsuit from a car crash, but I can't find out the name of the driver of the other car because they've blacked out the accident report. I, I believe they've gone too far. That's not what the right. DPPA requires, but municipalities are afraid of getting sued because it was so expensive for Palatine as a result of this. I will, as Attorney General, and I've promised this to the police chiefs and to the Badger sheriffs, I will get you a formal opinion to give you guidance on this so you at least have some shelter from getting sued when you release the information. But as far as getting the, the laws into this century, I will convene, and I'll chair it if I'm asked, in a gathering of the Newspapers Association, the Broadcasters Association, um, some of the public agencies that have an interest in this, like law enforcement uh, agencies, um, we'll bring everybody together and we'll make sure we've got the lawyers from the, from the uh, broadcasters and the, uh, and the print media there to make sure we don't screw anything up and do anything to restrict access to laws. But let's get it up to date so we don't have to keep going from court decision to court decision to find out what the rules are. Because when the court decides a case, they decided on nar the narrow facts of that case. It still leaves so many questions about what happens do you next. Think, do you think the law should do more to cover legislators? Because right now, um, there are cases where emails simply aren't kept because they don't have to be kept as public records by legislators. Well, that, that is definitely one of the things that we'll talk about when we convene this, this conference to, to discuss what to do with our, our public records laws. Yes. Let me ask you about the open meetings law when it comes to the legislature. In the at first challenge to Act 10 that was challenged right. over an open meetings violation, the Supreme Court ruled that effectively the open meetings law uh, d doesn't um, relate to the legislature. The, legis the legislature can easily get around the open meetings law that applies to school boards and common councils. Do you think, do you agree with that decision? And if you do, do you think the state constitution should be amended to make lawmakers uh, uh, subject to the open meetings law. I respect the decision of the Wisconsin Supreme Court. They make when they make their final determination. When the U.S. Supreme Court makes a final determination, that's the law of the land, and I will respect that as the state's attorney. Um, as to whether the legislature should make a change, it's an interesting dilemma because they're going to be making a change affecting <laughs> themselves. It'd be hard to do. Um, <laughs> Unlikely. But whether they make that change, it ultimately Whatever. is their determination and. Uh, you know, right now, I, I don't have a recommendation for what they should do with it. Um, another decision, the Randa decision, Judge Real Randa's decision on CRG, did, um, say about coordination, did you agree with that decision? Um, and if so, will your campaign be coordinating with any outside groups in these final weeks of the campaign? Whether I agree with the judge's decision or not is, is just irrelevant to doing the job. and. Um, but you can have an opinion. Sure I can. But why is my opinion relevant? We've got to be careful. We've got to be, and as Judge Randa noted, we've got to be very, very careful when we start restricting political speech because it is the first of the rights guaranteed in our, in our uh, U.S. Constitution uh, Bill of Rights. So we've got to be very, very careful when we start messing with that. In terms of your, aunt, your question so about whether my so camp... So I'm supposed to try to interpret this. So that means you generally agree with it or not? I mean, it, you're stating your opinion on a decision helps us give us insight into what your philosophy is as, a, as the state's top cop if you're elected. Um, I, and it sounds like you're saying you generally agree with what Rama said. Is that an accurate interpretation or not? I agree with the concerns that the First Amendment is, is something we need to guard. Those rights are something we need to guard very carefully. So you're not going to help me? I'm not going <laughs> to Now you asked about what my campaign but, but was going to do. Now you can coordinate with outside groups if you want to. Are you going to? We're going to proceed very cautiously. This is a federal district court decision. It's, it's, it's not probably not the end of the line on this question. And um, we're going to proceed very cautiously. And um, we're not coordinating with outside groups on, on what they're going to present. We're not doing it. We're, like I said, we were surprised when, when ads started yesterday. We didn't know that was going to happen, and we didn't know. I was hopeful, but I didn't know for sure whether there were going to be positive ads about me or negative ads about my opponent when an, any ads started up. So what if a candidate comes to you and says, uh, I, we read about this CRG opinion. Uh, 
it would it be okay for us to coordinate or not? What would you tell them? Or the governor's campaign, if they asked you what what you whether they should, you know now that this window's open whether they should go for it or not, what would you tell them? Is it legal or not? Right now, Judge Randa's decision is is the law until until it's either stayed or until um, until someone appeals and has a different end result. So it is the law right now. I would tell them to proceed with caution. Some environmental groups have been critical of, of the lack of enforcement actions um, involving the DNR under the Walker administration. Whether, that his, whether those enforcement actions are handled to the Attorney General is pretty much up to the DNR. Mm -hmm. But are there things you could do as Attorney General to encourage them for more enforcement actions? And do you think, mm -hmm. do you think they should? You know, I, I don't know what things they're failing to enforce. Okay. Um, I, I don't know how I could know that. You know, I can tell you something that uh, just recently the prosecutor in my office that does DNR enforcement and has been doing that for years yeah. was recently um, honored by the DNR eight, uh, wardens and uh, agents that work with her as uh, they, they gave her an award for the, for the work she's done over the years because they've been very pleased with our office. We have respected uh, the work they do, we recognize that what they're doing is important and that the environment is important, and we have worked hard to help make that happen. Do you, be do you believe the recent changes in the law does enough to help p families and uh, police involve shootings? You know, the recent change in the law is something that a lot of us had been doing for years. Um, in, in Waukesha County, we, we already had it as our, as our policy that an outside agency would investigate uh, uh, a case where an officer has used deadly force against another person. Um, this, I think that these laws make good sense to make sure that everyone does it in the best practice. And I think it is the best practice to make sure that an outside agency conducts the investigation and um, that can help the public have confidence in the outcome. And that's ultimately the, the important thing, is that the public be confident that it was a just outcome. So we have time for one more question. Uh, did you want to well, jump I in, Patrick? I want to go back to an environmental issue. Uh, you, okay. um, you received a $10,000 contribution from John Menard. Menard's has been, had, had at least a dozen um, uh, filings against it over environmental issues over the last, since the 1970s. Um, are you concerned at all about the public perception uh, that someone might be concerned that you would be soft on them, given that contribution? Well, I'm very grateful for the contribution from Mr. Menard. And, uh, and you know, it's necessary because we talked earlier about the ads that come from outside groups. I want to make sure that I'm running ads that say, approved by Brad, I'm Brad Schimmel and I approve of this ad. And it's necessary for me to raise that money. And also, it's been necessary for me to travel around the state to be able to raise money to help put the gas in the car and pay for the hotel rooms and things. So I'm grateful for that contribution. But Mr. Menard and anybody else who's made a contribution to my campaign has not bought anything except help for me getting the office. Anyone who wants access to the Attorney General's office with their concerns will find that I have an open door as I have, as, as I have had as the Waukesha County DA. And I will listen to views that are of people who supported me and people who didn't support me. And I'll, I'll respect all their views. But if I'm in a position that, that a contribution in my camp, pam, campaign created a conflict for me, then I may have to get outside counsel to take that case. Well, Brad Schimmel, thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate your time. And I'd like to remind our viewers that this video is available at our YouTube channel for the Journal Sentinel. It's also available at JS Online, and we'll have excerpts uh, later today. You can also see all the videos this week with Susan Happ, who is Brad Schimmel's opponent on the Democratic side for Attorney General, and with Governor Scott Walker, the Republican, running for re-election as governor, and Mary Burke, who we met with yesterday, who's the Democrat running for election as governor. Thanks for joining us on Fourth and State. <laughs>